um, we've got uh, about 45 minutes that we can uh, finish hearing from Kristen or, or uh, and so you want to pick up where you left off the other day, Kristen? Uh, sure, happy to. Um, and for the record, Kristen Haas with the Agency of Agriculture. So maybe you can clarify. My understanding was that there were, the committee had some questions about the uh, requirement that we're proposing in this bill related to swine and allowance for 96 hours for people to sort of regather, recapture their escaped domestic swine. Is that the area of focus for, for now? Yeah, that, that was a, a question that was raised and there may be others, but we can start with that one and, sure. and then move on. Okay, so um, the reason, so that the 96 hours um, was decided upon uh, jointly by us and the Department of the Agency of Agriculture and the Department of Fish and Wildlife and and we also um, had collaborated with USDA Wildlife Services on this language and um, so they were involved in the conversations as well. Basically we came up with 96 hours for a couple of of reasons and again this is the time that would be given to an individual uh, pig farmer or pig owner to, to again recapture or regather their animals if they were to escape. And the, the way that we came up with that um, is that we already have a precedent established in the CWD rule um, related to captive cervids, captive deer, when they escape. Um, there is a requirement for the owner to notify the Agency of Agriculture by the next business day once they become aware of escapees, but then they do have 96 hours to get those deer um, back into an enclosure. So um, we wanted to try and mirror that time allotment in this language. It seemed to all of us involved in the conversation like a reasonable period of time to allow somebody to make arrangements to get their pigs back in while not being too long of a period such that we end up with more or the owner ends up with more issues of, of pigs maybe dispersing further away or making it more difficult for them to, to be recontained. Um, so it seemed like a happy medium uh, between those two things. And then another point that maybe is worth clarifying is that, you know, this proverbial clock would only start after notification. So neither we nor the Department of Fish and Wildlife are going to be pitching tents outside of people's <laughs> properties, you know, looking for this to happen. So, so there would have to be a notification that would sort of set that um, starting point for that 90 96 hours. And of course, the goal would be to um, to help ensure that people get their pigs captured again, that that's the collective goal, not to do anything um, different than that. But we want to be able to have a reasonable period of time in which to act should they be yeah. unsuccessful in, in containing them. So that's where the 96 hours comes in. And, um, you know, as you can tell, it's not it, it's not a more scientific proposal than, than what I've described. Um, there isn't really science that applies here. It's more to do with operational soundness and fairness and equity with the, with the swine farmers and swine owners. So that's how we came up with that. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And is there any, um, I guess I'm struck that if a if a farmer uh, was being entirely cooperative and working alongside you to recapture the their animal, that this still would take effect. That 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 that, uh, and I wonder if that's true in practice. Um, in terms of you know taking an animal and and just could you help us understand that because I'm wondering if we ought to clarify or have some distinction there? Yep, so the goal um, of the owner presumably would be to get them recaptured or recontained. Our goal, and, and I think I can speak for our partner agencies and say the same, our collective goal would be to, to work with them to do that, even if 
they were unsuccessful, the owner was unsuccessful in getting those animals contained again. Um, as I think the situation last year demonstrated, our steps would be to try and provide, bring resources to bear to that situation to just augment that effort, not necessarily automatically take a, a completely different approach. Um, the thing that maybe is worth mentioning here too, in answer to your question, Senator, is that um, I mentioned when we talked on Friday that USDA Wildlife Services has a lot of expertise, equipment, supplies, et cetera, that they can bring to bear. But because they are um, a non-regulatory portion of USDA, they need to be able to operate under some sort of state authority to bring those resources to bear. And so this is as much about identifying and clarifying that state authority so that we can engage those that partner and, and help with the situation as, as anything else. I mean, and I, you know, the end goal is to have these animals contained again. So if there was a circumstance where, um, people are just not making an effort or, or are failing in that, then, um, you know, there are a couple different outcomes possible. But I can tell you that our first approach would be to bring those resources to bear and, and work with them to continue to be successful in that effort. So if you bring the resources to bear requires this trigger. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yes. What we what we found out um, in 2019 was that in the circumstance there where there were escaped domestic pigs that were um, located on, on neighboring properties and stuff, when we really dug down into the current statutory language and our rules and both we, the we being Agency of Agriculture and Department of Fish and Wildlife, we realized that we we didn't have a clear authority to take any action under which USDA Wildlife Services could, could act as our partners slash subcontractors to bring the, the traps and the cameras and the um, other resources to try and get the situation under control. So we had to shoot that, um, the scenario we were working with went you know, up through the higher ups of, of uh, USDA Wildlife Services to try and clarify under whose authority would they be using federal equipment, federal funding to, to try and, and help. So this, this would clarify that. I, I'm yep. sorry, Mr. Chair, but could I just have a follow up? Sure, sure. So uh, as we read through it, I, I would say for myself, it sounded like we were setting a clock at which point if, <laughs> if necessary, uh, the animal, could be killed right and and because it's a menace we haven't it hasn't worked but i'm hearing you say that's a little portion of it but also it's really about bringing in federal resources to help recapture an animal yes that that can be an equally likely and a hopeful outcome of this circumstance so so uh is it actually a problem that it's a fairly long window and and could there be a, a, a bifurcated option where you could more quickly get federal resources, but have some time before Vermonters felt like their animals would be taken um, while you've also got the resources that you need to, to handle a, a runaway? Hmm. So in other words, would there be an option for, in that scenario, wildlife services to bring equipment and supplies and expertise prior to the 96 hours should somebody request it or, or be yeah. you know, interested in that assistance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, would hope, so, I would hope that would be the case once, they're, once they notify the yeah. agency that their pigs are out and they're trying to collect them wouldn't wouldn't the agency go within a day and try to see how they were making out and if it was real difficult jump in to help i think by you know in in a practical sense from having gone through the situation last year it 
to coordinate that, we we probably would look at, be looking at a several day period anyway. So when push comes to shove, I, I think that that between the animals escaping, the owner um, deciding that they're not going to be able to mitigate the situation themselves, contacting uh, the Agency of Agriculture and Department of Fish and Wildlife, us then coordinating with USDA Wildlife Services, that probably is going to be over a several day period anyway. I mean, I can tell you that our practice would be um, if somebody were to notify us on day one and a half that, hey, my pigs are out and I'm so far not being successful getting them back in, we would not wait until a magic 96 hour period to then start having conversations with wildlife services and giving them the heads up that, hey, this, you know, this might be going on and, and we might be requesting your, your assistance. I, I can't speak for the Department of Fish and Wildlife on that, but I would assume that their practice would be the same. Where There's not a, the 96 hours I think should be looked at as, as if if the if the situation goes in a direction where we have to take more permanent and maybe undesirable action, then we want to give people an adequate window. But in the instance where we are um, able to provide assistance and and get these other resources, probably it's going to take a several day period to coordinate that anyway. Is maybe how I would think of that. Yeah, <laughs> I've rose. Yeah, um, I, I'm just skimming through the language as you're talking, and it seems to me that the 96 hours is after the 96 hours, a loose pig is considered a feral swine, and a feral swine basically can be shot if it's a feral swine, and, and can be, that's legal if it's considered a feral swine, but I, I don't see anything that talks about prior to the 96 hours, the agency of ag and natural resources will coordinate with the USDA to help catch feral swine or to help catch the pigs before they become feral swines. And that, that's sort of what you've described, but I don't see it in the language. It, it, it just seems to me that the language is about removing feral swine, not about catching non-feral pigs. Do you understand what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's a it's a consequence driven set of language basically versus versus language that captures what our normal practice in interacting with farmers would be is now and would continue to to be um, even yeah. even if this were to pass. So I'm wondering if it might be helpful to yeah. add some language that says first and foremost we want to be helpful. We want to catch the pigs for, so we preserve the animals of a farmer and protect the public from their you know damage they may do and if we're not able to do that then the pigs can be de deemed feral after a, a certain amount of time and then these are the consequences if they're deemed feral but something that says beforehand we're going to be working collaboration with the farmer because it it seems like punitive and not collaborative in the language as it is now, unless I'm missing something, Michael. There's no specific reference to the agency or the department having to coordinate with APHIS. Um, the agency does have general authority over the welfare and management and transport of livestock. Um, and when you read all of that authority together, um, they basically have the ability to respond to um, an issue of a pig being loose, um, as does the Department of Public Safety under Title 20. Um, but this is about giving the agency and the department the authority specifically to manage that loose animal in a way um, that currently would be animal cruelty. Um, and so uh, I think you could have a specific reference to them coordinating with APHIS or requesting APHIS's assistance prior to the 96 hours. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think they generally have that authority anyway. 
Um, if we could reference that and make it stronger, I think. Would you have any problems with that, Kristen? No. No. I just want to make sure that people don't think that this is just a, you know, a you thing that giving the authority to shoot a bunch of pigs instead of, hey, actually our goal is to to catch them and, and make sure they're safe and everybody else is safe, not to shoot them, <laughs> um, except for as a last resort, basically. Yeah, and no, we, we wouldn't have problem with that. I think um, the other thing to keep in mind and maybe Mike can, think about this what new this nuance is and, and that is we're, we're in this conversation talking about domestic pigs that escape there also have been in Vermont and will continue to periodically crop up truly feral you know by everyone's sort of typical stereotypical um, traditional definition feral swine and those we we want to, I don't, we don't want to inadvertently undermine the Department of Fish and Wildlife's authority to, you know, a game warden is out in the woods, runs into a, a more typical looking feral swine animal. There have been no reports of escape, no, no reason to believe that this is a domestic pig that has gotten out based on the appearance or the reporting or anything else. We don't want to undermine their ability to manage that wild animal in the moment. So as long as that doesn't inadvertently happen, um, we'd be fine with the added language on the domestic pig side. Yeah, I, I don't think we would want to stop that from happening, you know. Right. Fish and yep. wildlife want to take a, a wild boar and yeah, they, they're they really pretty bad. Yeah, uh, exactly. So is the committee in agreement with having Michael uh, draft up uh, uh, some new language to add to our present language to allow for that, uh, or reference it basically. Sure. Reference the present language that's already in statute. Uh, so that's good. Any uh, comments on that? Anthony's fine. Brian, you're good. Um, so you want to do that, Michael? Any Will other do. any other questions for Kristen in regards to her proposed changes? And no. And Kristen, have you have you chatted with the House Committee on on your proposed changes? Uh, the, the two that we discussed on Friday during during your committee meeting, yes, they, well, let me back up. We did provide testimony on the, those um, back with, before this bill crossed over to the Senate side. I have not re-communicated with the House Ag Committee post Friday, but I'm, I'm happy to do that if, if you would like, or Michael, if you think that's the best idea, or maybe you've talked with them. I'm not sure, but happy, happy to reach back out to them. Yeah, I, I, I talked to them this morning. Um, they asked the status of, of 656, and I told them that the agency had come in and asked for a couple of tweaks that were um, caused by my failure to make the changes um, in the House Committee. Yeah, and any comments, Michael, back or? No, I, I just think that they are just curious as to the yeah. stats of the bill, that's all. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Kristen? No, not Ruth? Well, I just wondered if we were gonna have, <laughs> every time Kristen's here, I'm like, oh, we gotta ask her this. Um, this is on a different topic. So is that okay since she's here? Or should we have her back? It's more about our, our COVID relief package for ag Should no, we you, wait or you yeah. can no ask we've got uh we've got time so sure okay. go ahead. so i don't mean to take you by surprise kristen but no. i know that you're in contact with um slaughter facilities and and the like around the state and that has come up as an issue um related to covid and how they are busier than normal and um we have been discussing sort of 
generally about how to help the ag sector and um, if there are things that would be helpful for our slaughter facilities to keep up with the demand and also um, sort of ease the the potential for culled um, dairy cows into the slaughter facilities if you've had those discussions or if there are health related things that the slaughter facilities may should do in order to um, avoid the disastrous horrible things that are happening in the rest of the country or just any thoughts you've had in your discussions with those facilities just in general uh sure so we have had the agency of ag has had discussions um one-on-one -on -one with several slaughter facility owners and managers as well as um sector-wide uh conference calls with the slaughter sector slaughter facility sector and first and foremost our message to them has been that it is hugely important for them to follow the the PPE and the personal protective requirement, the health and safety requirements that are in place under the current order. Um, and to, to do that religiously, not only to uh, protect their workers to make sure that there aren't unfortunate shutdowns of certain facilities, but also, you know, we have a vested interest in it from the standpoint of our own state employees are in those facilities as well, because they've been considered essential employees throughout. So um, making sure that they follow those uh, requirements has been top on our priority list and we've communicated that to them. Um, I know that Ellen Kaler and some uh, folks working with, with her have um, put together coaching teams for um, slaughter facility owners who are interested in utilizing that expertise and those resources to try and troubleshoot some of those issues. And um, the last that at least I was aware of uh, Ellen reporting back on that, that had been, you know, a fairly successful, they were having good, good progress with that. Um, I think I, I understand that there maybe has been talk or it's been alluded to that um, opening up or, or further relaxing the on farm slaughter allowances uh, for for people to slaughter at home and then sell that product. Um, it's my understanding that that's been discussed in different, different conversations. And I just would use this opportunity to remind folks that, you know, we, we do have to maintain the, the food safety standards that are in place. And that's why there are prohibitions and limits on um, what can be slaughtered on farm and then what, what the outcome or, or disposition of that product can be. Um, certainly, there perhaps is an option, and I don't know of anybody who's pursuing this right now, but um, you know, the, the whole custom slaughter uh, situation, there's perhaps room for expanding that, that sector, um, should somebody be interested in that, because that would allow um, maybe more access for folks who are uh, sending animals to slaughter and then intending on uh, consuming that product themselves. Um, so perhaps that could be an area that somebody might be interested in in exploring and you know could maybe do quite well at the at the moment. Um, I'm aware of one federal establishment in Vermont and this was several weeks if not maybe a month ago but they were looking at adding additional shifts to their um, operations and working with uh, food safety inspection service to do that to try and ease some of the some of the burden as well. Um, so those are, you know, that's been the activity on that front. And I think we've been very fortunate due to the good work of the slaughter facilities here to, to not be in the same situation as other parts of the country where that's been a significant, caused a significant backlog um, in, in livestock movement to, to slaughter. Um, the other thing that I was informed of by one of our employees who does the market reporting uh, at two at our livestock market here in Vermont, as well as one over in Cambridge, New York, is that the price per pound for uh, calves, for, for dairy calves and for uh, dairy, dairy beef has, has gone up a fair bit during recent weeks. So um, that that bodes well for dairy farmers who are who are taking advantage of that market too. Um, they might be able to get a little better price for their animal at this point. Yeah, uh, Michael. Uh, I just 
want to weigh in on this? The, the Federal Meat Inspection Act preempts state requirements, and I'm reading from a U.S. Supreme Court case. It precludes states from imposing requirements that are within the scope of the Federal Meat Inspection Act relate to slaughterhouse premises, facilities, and operations are in addition to or different than those made under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So I raise this because there's, um, I've been asked to look at this uh, material that's being circulated that says that states should amend their laws to allow slaughterhouses more flexibility. Um, and it's based on a assertion that Wyoming has done this. Now Wyoming has basically adopted an on farm slaughter law like Vermont has. They haven't changed what the slaughterhouses are required to do because the Federal Meat Inspection Act would have preempted that. Um, so if you're getting material that says you need to change or relax the requirements on slaughterhouses because Wyoming has done it, that's not accurate. Um, and mm. so you've already done what Wyoming has done and you did it four <laughs> years ago. No, uh, we're that far ahead. Yes. So sure it wasn't four months ago, four years. <laughs> Did Wyoming copy us? Pretty, it's pretty similar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you're, the Vermont law has more health and safety provisions written into it than the Wyoming law does. Yeah. Um, well, we don't and that And that, that law is authorized under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, as is the custom slaughter they're, they are both exceptions to the, the inspection requirements under the federal meat inspection. Yeah. So just, I just want people to be aware of that there's some disinformation that's circulating um, among certain communities. That, that's fake news, right, Michael? <laughs> I, 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 I just, it's just an incorrect interpretation oh, incorrect. of the Wyoming law. So. <laughs> uh, Ruth, you had a question? No, I just want to follow up quickly. Um, uh, thanks for that, Michael. I have not seen that. Um, so I'm glad to hear that we are um, already, you know, better than the rest of the country. <clears throat> uh, but uh, Kristen, so I it doesn't... I've always known that, Rose. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, it doesn't sound like you have any specific uh, recommendations for slaughterhouses um, that we should take up at this point, ba you know, based on COVID. Uh, you're it sounds like things are going well in terms of their health and safety and their operations. Um, do the, and okay, I just want to clarify to make sure because it sounds like you had said a few things that could be done, but not anything that you would say should be done. Is that accurate? well? I think that um, because these are pretty extraordinary circumstances, I I think the the way the method that's being used to try and ensure compliance and education of of um, owners and managers and their employees is perhaps more productive than for instance putting into passing a law that says thou shalt do these certain things i that's maybe my own just personal opinion but i um but i think this is a unique enough circumstance that the the education and outreach method um, seems to be getting more traction and more success than, you know, a, a hardline mandate and then punitive action if if things aren't aren't being followed. Yeah, that wasn't actually what I was I was asking if you if there was anything we could do to be helpful and if they needed anything that we should include in our relief package, not if we should put extra requirements on them. It's, I'm glad that they're following the recommendations, um, but wondering if they needed additional support or anything that's related to COVID. You know, Senator, might I suggest, and I don't know if you've posed that question to uh, Ellen Kaler and um, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, but she has, again, they've done a lot of work and have had a lot of good conversations um, with the with the slaughter facility sector. So I, I think actually, maybe feedback from those discussions would would be the best information that you could go on. Um, the okay. role we have with slaughter facilities is a regulatory role. So so 
it's a little bit of a different camp that you're talking about here, but I would urge you to reach out to Ellen perhaps with that question because she might have some suggestions for helpful relief components that are based on feedback she's received from that sector. Okay, yeah, we have a list from Ellen, so I will okay. reach out to see if it has anything about slaughter facilities on it. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, sure, thank you. And uh, Kristen Longer on, is there any, uh, have you heard any, a talk uh, amongst the slaughter people about uh, getting any contracts out of southern New England for for native beef from us or anything anything along those lines because they've been a shortage um, I know in mass and and down that way. Senator, I have I have not. No, I've not been privy to those conversations. I mean, where where's uh, I think more of the conversations I have been in are are, are involved with trying to navigate um, some of the movement of livestock into Vermont and into New England and the Northeast in general um, as a result of the bottlenecks elsewhere in the country, but. But that's been more on the live animal side um, versus the you know the the postmortem the slaughter the slaughter side of of those conversations so i'm i'm not i haven't been privy to the category of conversation that you're asking about yeah um other questions for kristen as long as she's with us no. if you don't have questions i have one other question for you all if if we have time well uh, you got us, so I guess we better make time. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be brief. Um, it, it actually is related to the swine language in 656, and um, I think it's the result of the longer you sit with language, the more sort of Monday morning quarterbacking we tend to do. And um, after Friday's conversation uh, in talking with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we identified what might be an unintended consequence of the current proposed language, but that could be relatively easily clarified. Um, and so I wanted to just run that by you guys. And that is that um, wondering if the, if the committee would consider a slight adjustment to the notification language on, um, and this is on page four of that condensed version on line two, and I can I can read it to you. Um, it requires that. Can we just get oriented on the full bill? What page we're talking about there? Yeah. Uh, it, is it the notification that the department shall notify the agency of ag? Yes. The disposition of feral yes, swine. Michael, yep. That's on page 26, subdivision okay. five. And it's the paragraph, it, it reads, um, let me make sure I have the right one. Okay, yeah. It reads, uh, any feral swine may be removed or destroyed by the department, the agency of agriculture, or a designee and I'm just summarizing here. And then it goes on to say, the department shall notify the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets prior to the removal or destruction of the feral swine. The scenario that we got down into the weeds about on Friday is that, and again, it goes back to maybe Senator Starr, your prior comment. If our state game wardens run across a, a, a traditional feral swine in the woods, on the top of a mountain with no cell service and there's no no um report of escapees these aren't domestic pigs we don't want to undermine their ability to to manage that wild animal in that moment and so what we were wondering is if it, if at the end of that sentence um there could be some clarification that the notification is required if it is a feral swine as defined by F1A, which would be the domestic pig category of feral swine. And then in the other circumstances, I mean, if a game warden runs across a, a Eurasian boar in the middle of the woods, they don't 
they don't have to be in touch with me or us or the Agency of Agriculture before they take action on that animal. And we don't want to create a situation where we're inadvertently requiring them to do so. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, yeah, I wouldn't think of, there is a, there is a vast difference between a domestic pig that's been loose for a week than a wild boar mm -hmm. that's been wild for who knows how long. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we ought to mix that up. If they, I, I would think if Fish and Wildlife runs across a wild boar, they ought to be able to take care of it without notifying anybody. I don't know, is that something we could write in there, Michael, if the committee so chooses? Uh, well, I think if you do what Dr. Haas has recommended that they would have that ability. They don't have to wait 96 hours to take uh, a Eurasian boar. Um, so I, I think if you just clarify the language in the way Dr. Haas has suggested, I think you, you've given them that authority. Yeah, is that fine with everybody? Looks like everybody's in agreement. Uh, so uh, we could do that. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Doc. Okay. Could I just ask a question, Mr. Chair? Yeah, sure. I'm fine with that suggestion. Dr. Haas, so I'm curious, it, would that be automatic that, that the game warden would uh, take, take the, the boar? I mean, we, we just sort of have a zero tolerance for wildlife management in that regard. Well, I, um, I mean, that would be a good question for them, but I would say based on my understanding of our collective um, approach to truly feral, you know, wild boar, yes, that, that would be what, what would be done. And that's happened a couple of times, um, mostly with escapees from a high fence facility in uh, New Hampshire. And yeah, I mean, there's biology here that has to be taken into consideration. And sometimes if there's a group of, of wild boar, then, um, then shooting them or trying to shoot one of them actually further disperses the remainder of the group. But if they come across a singleton animal that's by itself, then yeah, my understanding is that they need to have the flexibility to take immediate action on that animal. Thanks. Any other questions? No. I think years ago, many years ago, there was a wild game place down near Fairley or down that way. And we had all kinds of problems with getting that resolved. So this would be good to get that taken care of. Um, so are there other issues, Kristen, that you'd like to bring up? Or no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for the opportunity to bring that up. I know it's it's a little late in the game, but it, again, we sit with this longer and then want to help ensure unintended negative consequences of language that we're trying to put into place to do good things. So. And did you have any other sections in uh, 656 that uh, you addressed on the house side? Uh, yes, we did. We had, um, let's see, there, there is a weights and measures section in 656 that- um, oh, on the oil trucks. On the oil trucks, yep. That falls into the shop that I work within. Uh, we have a, um, the uh, change in the definition to amenable species under the meat inspection section and the, and the removal of rabbits from that list, that, that goes to meat inspection. Um, we have some animal health related uh, language in the bill that um, it, it was an inadvertent uh, on our part, our mistake when we updated our animal health statutes a couple of years ago. Um, we, we ended up creating a situation where livestock dealers, uh, the record keeping requirements that used to be in place were, were inadvertently loosened. And um, so what is in 656 is um, a reinsertion of that language to ensure that they keep 
adequate traceability records. So that was the other piece that um, I and colleagues I work with provided testimony on. I think yeah. that I think that was all of them. I think. Yeah. My and yes. <laughs> yeah. So everything is fine then uh, with with what your parts in the bill are fine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Well, uh, any anything else for Kristen from anybody? If not, uh, thank you very much for your time, Kristen, and stay thank healthy. You. Yeah, I will do that. Enjoy the sun. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you all. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so uh, Anson still doing some conference thing, so he can't be with us. Uh, Linda, are you on? Yes. It, did you get an email or a call or something? I got an email from him. Yeah. And I, I also heard from Peter Sterling that you should be uh, done by 9.45 tomorrow. So I asked Anson to come from 10 to 11.30 tomorrow. Yeah, and that's all okay? Anson is good with that. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, only, uh, the only other thing, um, I think we, you know, we've got to get this bill geared up as a committee and and go through it. Um, Michael will probably have these changes by the next time, by maybe tomorrow if we have time. Or, but we should, uh, we, you know, we should move forward with it and try to get it maybe done up where we feel comfortable this week if we can can if we have time and so we can get it uh, reported maybe next week um uh rose yeah i was just wondering if there's are are there uh is there an opportunity to add anything to this bill did you have any ideas on what you might have wanted to add i'm trying to remember back to everything um on my list the th something that's come up is the the forestry, the carbon sequestration forestry bill that actually unfortunately didn't get to our committee, but is in natural resources. But there may be other things that sort of were left hanging, wondering if there's any opportunity to add them here. Well, it's a mis miscellaneous bill. There's a zillion parts to it. I'm sure we can do whatever you would like to do. Um, <laughs> And well, somebody, somebody could rule us non-germane, but I, I kind of figure out. I, I bet we can figure out a way around that. So, well, I, I seek your guidance, Mr. Chair. I know you're the master of it, so that's why I was asking what your thoughts were. <laughs> the, the milk bill that we talked a lot about, off and on. Uh, yeah, it's. I'd, I'd love to do that, but I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable with the timing right now with, with all the, you know, the COVID-19 stuff. I, I haven't talked with Michael about it, but I, I think we're, you know, we're up to our nose in, in problems and it isn't a good time to <clears throat> try to push forward, uh, you know, a kind of a controversial, uh, but I think very meaningful pricing system. It, it's, you know, we just got too many damn problems facing us to, to do that. And I don't know if any of you have got an opinion on that, but I mean, not that I wouldn't like to, I just don't think I don't feel comfortable with the timing. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's true of, I don't want to say monkeying with, but uh, modifying this bill too much is, is we are slowly seeing the uh, available time closing in. If you look closely at the Budget Adjustment Act this morning, we're only going to be able to uh, stay around until I think the 18th of June, which is about three more weeks. So if we change this bill, then it's gotta go back to the house 
and they can either concur or not. And then you might wind up with a conference committee. So I'm not necessarily saying I'm against anything that people want to do. I'm just very aware that the window is closing pretty quickly. We don't have the luxury of being, you know, in the middle of February. Yeah. Well, well I think I think any changes that we propose, uh, it would be it would be wise to run them by the House Committee, uh, you know, during our discussion. Once we get them up to where we think it, the change should be. Uh, run it by the house committee to see if we can get you know at least half of them to one more than half to support it so that carolyn can get you know an agreement on it you know move to adopt the senate proposals of amendment and it's over with so i i think that would be a, a wise move but a good move uh chris yeah, I, I agree with that, Mr. Chair. And I, I just remind Brian, we are making changes of some kind, uh, at least if we follow oh, sure. Dr. So, so it is going back. Um, we're not adding a section. Yet. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, your point is, is a very valid one. Um, I'm also curious, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, the COVID relief concept has taken a few turns now the governor uh adopting some of our ideas and, and yeah. but not others and we're waiting to hear from the secretary i understand that but I, I would assume we're still moving forward with a proposal that we would send to you and others in a probes is that accurate well we don't really know do we uh, uh i know they they, uh, you know, I've met with economic development and whether they're going to try to put this all through under one bill and, but we're going to have to deal with, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what goes to economic development, but we're going to deal with the ag stuff. Okay. As you I know, understand. High water. Uh, that's our jurisdiction, and I think Michael, Michael's good to work with on our side, and uh, so uh, you know I think I think we'll uh, we'll be dealing with the ag material. Good. And, and as far as I understand it, and I think we would all vote that yeah, Michael's okay to work with. Um, as I understand uh, it, I wasn't talking about O'Grady. I see you <laughs> smiling. You've always been good to work. <laughs> sure, Hawking knows good to work with too. Oh. It, those damn guys with the name Michael are just good people. <laughs> um, yes, I wish sometimes Senator Sorokin had uh, Mr. O'Grady's ease, sense of ease. <laughs> At any rate. Um, as I understand it, tomorrow, Senator Kitchell, part of our all Senate call will be a little bit of a, an understanding of, of how we're moving forward with the COVID. Yeah, so maybe right. We'll get clarity, clarity there. Um, uh, but I certainly, um, I guess I, I'm wondering if you want, Mr. Chair, us to um bring you people we'd like to hear from to inform that uh, last week while you were out we had uh, come up with kind of a, a little bit of a framework to keep exploring including some of the people we maybe would speak to so uh we can talk about that offline but um i think there is we, we're not we're not going to have an abundance of time to senator collimore's point um and and our ability to do interesting things and help the ag sector, you know, are going to require some time. Yeah, that that's why I, I had a scheduled all week this week, every morning. So I thought we could get, you know, ahead of the curve a little bit instead of dragging behind us. Okay. But sure, go ahead and, and get your list lined up and and be thinking about you know, you've already talked about some things you'd like to see added in. And, uh, you know, 
like I, I'm kind of waiting on ants and the, the numbers that he gave me last week. Um, well, I think it was Friday when they cut that all loose. Um, you know, on the different farm sizes, uh, I, I think those numbers are out of whack, uh, you know, on proportion uh, to like, a small farm of under 50 cows. Uh, I had the written written down the number I thought that he gave me it was like forty two thousand dollars. Well, you know, if you've only got forty two cows or fifty cows, and you're going to get, you know, that I think there's too much money there, and and then if you get to, you know, to the top end, uh, you're pretty light. Uh, 110 for somebody that's got, say, 1,500 cows is is light. So I think we've got to, you know, get some people in and talk about how that how that should be divided up. And and I th I want to make sure that. Um, you know, everybody gets used somewhat fairly, but I want to make sure that the small and medium guys get used good. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of money there, so everybody should be able to get used fairly if we, if we do the uh, 40, 40 million. Well, and, it in the top end of that extra 10, I have not a clue how they're proposing to distribute that. And have you got any ideas on that? Or have you heard, Michael? Uh, uh, the secretary testified to House Ag this morning. He said that the agency is going to administer the program. Um, there are 760 dairy, including goat and other that would be qualified under the program. And they feel that they are confident that they can um, provide, it's a, gonna be a one-time check from my understanding um, to the 740 farms. 740 or 760? 760, 760. Yeah. Um, and so there's, there's a lot in that under 50 cows then. Somewheres, right? He, there would probably, and this is just a rough, maybe 250. I think that would probably be the, around that number. So did- 250 did to 300. It, did they have it broken down in categories? How much? Yeah, it's the, it's the same cat. They didn't have the numbers broken, like the number of farms broken down. They had it broken down to the way that you were just describing it. Mr. Chair, with the the small farm, non-certified, the certified small farm, the medium, and the large farm. And the large farm will get 110, the medium will get 90, the certified small farm will get 60, and the small farm will get 42. See, and, and the way we had ours set up, um, you know, we had the small guys getting under the 275 under small farm, just getting like a $5,000 check. Uh, did they say anything about verification uh, that they had those kind of losses? They uh, did say that uh, the farms need to qualify and part of qualification is um, certifying losses or expenses due to COVID. Uh, I don't know if they're going to self-certify or have some sort of vetting. I think self-certification would probably be the easiest. Um, but that's well, that's my understanding. We had we had uh, I thought some pretty good certifying language that that we developed. Uh, you know that it'd be self-certifying, I believe, but you know that they at least had to do a little something. 
Yeah, I think the the certification language in your bill was in the um, the non dairy section, and not in the dairy section. I we didn't have. I thought we clarified that that language in the dairy section to some degree. They had I, I, to be milking, and they had to be in good standing. Yeah. And, uh, we got to a, I don't know whether we've decided yet on that survey, whether they have to fill it out or whether it should be kind of like, would you like to fill it out? I see Senator Pearson smiling, so I have a feeling I know what side he's on. Um, Rose? Yeah. yeah, I guess since we started talking about this, but I, I also, I have a comment on it, but I also wanted to ask Bobby, did we get, did we just get a couple bills referred to us from the house? that are separate from the well, we, we got one uh is it 254 uh but uh we got that one but the other house bill they shipped off to natural the tree warden one we didn't get that one no that went to natural because they're into forestry big time and natural resources. Okay, so maybe the forestry issue that I just brought up that the carbon sequestration thing would be more appropriate on that bill if they want to. Well, you it. better talk to your county mate and have him put it right on. I'm sure he'd jump on that. I'm, I'm right. sure, I'm sure he would, you know. <laughs> ask and you shall receive yeah well I, I, I don't know i'm just trying to figure out if there's an avenue left for that um at least getting part of it in there the language um, but well, uh, why don't you check and see if if he'll deal with that and don't you don't push the issue but if he doesn't we'll figure out a place to tuck it into our bill okay sounds good yeah. and then I had a question for Michael, since we were talking about the dairy package, I heard from a farmer in my district that the feds had um, figured out how they finally figured out how they're distributing their aid to dairy and that it's based on milk volume for the first three months and that it's really geared toward helping the large milk producers so that the larger dairy operations would probably see the vast majority of that funding and it's not no, that's not I, accurate. is that not accurate I, it would be just really helpful to get a better understanding of how the federal money is being distributed so we could you know dovetail ours fill in whatever holes that is missing it's uh, the first michael's got it i'm sure if he wants to but the first three months are at 85 percent based on 100 weights but capped at 125. And then the next three months is 30%, I believe. And the following three months, if there are, that'd be 30 or 35% of, of their, based on their production. My anywhere is near right, Michael? I am sending you the press release from USDA that they released last week that has all the details in it. Okay, that's great. Because I think they came out with the rules last week. Isn't that correct, Michael, that clarified some yeah, of the- Yeah, well, yeah, the, the requirements, yep. Yeah. So, um, you. you're welcome. And it would be good to look that over before we have Anson on tomorrow. Yeah, you know, so we got something to compare by. So Anson's not coming today, he's coming tomorrow? Yeah, he, he was tied up. I got a note uh, that he's tied up, but he's going to come tomorrow at um, 1030. Oh, okay. Okay. I misunderstood. So, I thought we were waiting for him now. Well, that's why I've ram not really rambled on, but let the discussion kind of float because he couldn't make it. And uh, no, okay. I wouldn't hold him up uh, that long. And is, do, uh, we have a, do we have a sense? It sounds like Chris, maybe you were saying that we might know this more tomorrow from our caucus, but uh, you know, the, 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 the agency's package is, 50 million total it's 40 for dairy and then 10 for cheese <laughs> yeah. and i'm wondering if 
is 50 what we get to work with or do we have more or do we have less? I mean, cause I, we had a lot of pieces in our bill that are not included in theirs. And so it's, a, you know, I don't want to forget the other portion. My, I don't know the answer. Um, I believe that Senator Kitchell will help us begin to understand the framework that she's applying and possibly the whole you know, probably learn, I, I, I don't know. So I, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, one idea I heard was, you know, there's a lot of money in the governor's proposal for restaurants. Um, you know, somebody wondered to me, well, why don't we hook that to make some sweetener to buy local farm, far, you know, produce or whatever, uh, locally produced goods you know, I, I, and I, that's where I think there's tremendous opportunity to help the restaurants and drive the money back into the local economy. And, and you know, I think that the latest data we have is a dollar local generates about a buck 60 of economic activity. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful we'll keep our eye on the whole thing. I'm hopeful yeah. I gather we'll have a little broader understanding uh, tomorrow morning and then um, go to work to work for dairy, but also the broader ec uh, ec the whole group. economy. Sure. Come on, we have to do that. I, I, yeah. I'm firm about that. And Jane is, Jane's very supportive of, you know, our, our whole crew, you know, uh, the little guys and, and uh, no, that, that'll help, um, you know, a great deal um so uh michael you, do you want to fool with those numbers a little bit and the money or you want me to call you and talk with you about how that could be divided up on a more fair basis and maybe we could even keep a little of that money if it worked out right to do something else to help our small producers however you want to handle it if you want to call me or if you want I, I i would prefer you to give me some direction on how you want those numbers to break down well see yeah you, you know you have to figure if there's 250 little farms and and you they're proposing to do 42 million no 40 40 40 42 thousand right 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 well how that breaks out per farm and then and uh you know you've got uh, the small certified farms that uh, 60,000 each uh, and, and the number on them should be around the same I believe to, to something 268 and the medium size is 105 of them and you know 90, 90 is pretty fair for that crew uh, you know but it, how, how it figures out and then and see you know, who's getting maybe too much and who isn't getting enough and and uh, but anyways any any other questions chris well i i just have a basic question senator hardy mentioned the federal uh package and and I'm, i'll look at what michael just sent us but do you believe, do you understand, and we can ask Anson tomorrow, are we meaning to supplement that, add to it, or let that go where it's going and, and us hit what it misses? Yeah, ours would be totally separate, and it would be to supplement, supplement the federal uh, losses. And uh the you know some of the one of the big guys that i talked with off and on uh amanda you guys all know amanda st pierre 
Um, they're, they're losing about $75,000 a week on, on um, you know, their, their cuts that they've had to take. Uh, of course, they're a huge, you know, they're a big, big firm. Um, but the average guy is like Ruth's friend, uh, Bill. <laughs> That's your friend, Bill. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's my he, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're supposed to be mentoring him, or he's your mentor. Bill is <laughs> a mentor? I didn't well, know that. You're not a, <laughs> no, I'm I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to uh, clarify that with him. His his losses are you know much less than than that. They're like uh, forty thousand dollars a milk check. Uh, the little guy that I talked with up in Holland, a small farm, uh, his milk check one was five thousand less, and the second one was the next check was eight thousand less. So those little guys are taking it on the chin pretty hard too. And, and uh, so, you know, we've got to be somewhat fair as fair can be to, to even that out. But we'll look over Michael's, that federal program and, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll look that over because I haven't, I haven't seen what Michael's going to send us. So. I'll look that over. See how much the little guys are going to get. Yeah, it doesn't have any Anything of this. It doesn't have the specific number. I'm looking at it right now, but it, it does. It is mostly based on the first quarter. So and, it, I yeah. sent a, a second document from FSA oh. and they have it as the chair was referring earlier for the months of January, February and March. The, each producer is going to have the um, payment of $4.71 multiplied by the 100 weight of milk production for those months. So that's what they'll get for those months, which is going to be approximately 80 to 85%. And then for uh, $4.71. Yeah. And then for uh, after that, for for um, uh, they don't have the payment for after that on the FSA document, um, but it's going to be based on a, a projected adjustment, which is effectively what they were talking about before uh, the thirty percent. I have to get you more information about from March on. It's not in the FSA document I just sent. What it yeah. says in the, the site that I'm looking at is that for the pay, each eligible producer payment is calculated by multiplying the hundred weight of milk production for the months of January, February, March by the national adjustment of 1.014 and by $1.47. That's for the second payment. It still seems like it's on the first quarter. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, they, they, they break it down and there's the CARES Act funds and then the, the CCC funds, the Commodity Credit Corporation funds. So the $1, 1.014 and 1.47, that's the Commodity Credit funds. Um, and then the CARES Act funds uh, from the 9.5, that's, that's the $4.71 in that first quarter. So, uh, so how much you don't have the thirty percent for the second quarter? Then? No, I don't have that that info. I'm going to have to get it um, from FSA. Yeah. Well, you can work work on that then, Michael. Yep. Yeah. Any any other questions or things that anybody wants to bring up? No. Nope. Senator no. Polina and I have another meeting at one o'clock. So. Well, I guess you better get with it, keep your tie on, and get going. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, we'll see you on the full Senate uh, meeting in the morning, and then we'll 
sort stag at 10.30 or quarter after 10. Okay? I, yeah. At 10. Yeah. Thank you, Linda, Michael.